Okay, guys and gals, so this video goes out to my really good friend, Mike. Mike of Ransom International. So, Mike, I have your Frankenstein ready, and now you're going to see what the delay was, because I've got this all cleaned up for you. And in just a minute, I'm going to give an overview of how this works. Uh, but first, Mike, I have something for you. I have a gift that I want to give you. So, you originally sent me the three original Ransom Grandmasters, one of them being this Frankenstein right here. This was the Frankenstein model that, that he used to develop his actual production model. So, with those three loaders that you sent me, you also included this subscription of hand loader. This was the May, June of 81, number 91 issue. In this issue, there's a brief write-up of the Ransom Grandmaster. Well, you know, Mike, my mind went back in time. You see, back when I was a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, in those years, I used to go over to a little mercantile store, and they would have the all the gun magazines, and in there was the hand loader issues. You know, Mike, I remember seeing this Grandmaster. Do you know what I remember? Shortly after that, an issue pretty much consecutive to this had a full write-up. You know, I got to thinking about that, Mike. I went over onto eBay and I took a chance right here. Number 92, July, August of 1981. My mind went back to 81. The issue just after that issue. When you go in here to page 22, what do you see? Very detailed write-up an explanation of the mechanical workings of your original grandmasters. So Mike, this is my gift to you because you trusted me with your three grandmasters. So now, what do you say? I give you a close-up of this. I'll show you the uh, working. I, I think you'll really like it. I cleaned it up. So what do you say we uh, zoom in on this and check it out? Okay, Mike, how's it look? In just a moment, you're going to understand why I held on to this for just a little longer. Because this looks nothing like what it looked like when you sent it to me. When I received this and we were talking on the phone, the one question that we both had was, did old Ransom actually use this press for reloading ammunition? Or was this something that he pieced together that was the predecessor to what he actually began loading on? When I received this, it was covered in grease, dirt, and production grind. This handle was pretty much froze up. I could actuate it, but once I brought the handle to rest, it was hard to get it going again. But think about it. In 1981, when Ransom introduced the actual production model 
he had no more need for this. I'm convinced, based off of the amount of oil I found on this, he oiled it up to preserve it and he stored it away in a production environment, a working man's environment. Okay? Now, the development of this actual press, this Frankenstein, began. 15 years before 1981. That would mean this loader is 51 years old. Because of that, I wanted to keep it together to maintain the integrity of what this is. So I cleaned it up by hand without disassembling anything. And this is what we have. The actual Ransom Grandmaster Frankenstein in the exact condition that old Ransom left it. So the question is, did he actually produce ammunition off of this Frankenstein? I would have to say, absolutely he did. And I'll tell you, he put an awful lot out of this. You'd say, well, how do you know? I would say part of the integrity of this would be not to clean where the working man's hands were. You see, 51 years ago, this is where Ransom's mind was. He was thinking of the progressive loader. This is the prince of a working man's hands. Takes a lot to get a handle looking that way. How good did it work? That nice. This runs as smooth as what I sent you back. It has the leverage. It's not a problem. And you know, when we say this looks nothing like that, well, that could be because this main body support system is sitting up higher. So after running this, you know, he changed a couple things, such as, let's talk about the priming system. You see, the priming system here is just underneath this plate deck is right here. And if you were to see how that operated, you would realize it operates just like the priming system in this, except for the parts in the production model were made in a way that you could affordably manufacture them and you could assemble it on a factory level ease of assembly. That makes sense, right? But past that, this priming system works a lot like this priming system, and it's actually located in the same place. You say, no, this one is located in the body. I would say the only thing Ransom did is he put a cover on this. This base and this plate, we have a base here, a plate here, and a nice looking cover. It just made it look good. That's what he did. Did the priming system work? Absolutely it worked. I'm convinced that Ransom oiled this down because the priming tubes, it was all oiled up and it had grime in there from a working man's environment. Upon me flushing that out, getting a ton of crud out, I could see that was a functional system, but I left it for the integrity of the press, but that priming system was built to work. Yes, that priming system worked. There's your priming tube. Somehow got broke off. If we had a priming tube, we clean that up, you would have a, a working priming system and it's adjustable. Okay? He was thinking ahead. Let's talk about the tool head. The tool head where the dies are located. 
When you look at the original Frankenstein tool head, you say, all right, we got die position one, resize decap, die position two, expand, die position three, seat. Ah, 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 ah. That's wrong. This is a powder drop tube right here for our powder measure, which would mean with one die position left, he would have been seating and crimping in the same step of the process. Now let's go back 51 years ago. It wasn't uncommon in um, a lot of the earlier days, earlier articles, to hear them talking about seating and crimping on the same step. But as hand loading evolved into more precision, that was a more separated step, which meant, you see, old Ransom 51 years ago, he was making this a, a, a tight, compact machine. But he said, you know what? I'm going to evolve this. I'm going to, I'm going to set this into, it's, it's it set it up so that it's, I can seat and crimp on the different steps of the process. Here we have resize decap. There we have expander. There we have our powder. There we have our seat. There we have our crimp. On this machine, he introduced the fourth die hole so that he could seat and crimp two different steps. Past that, everything was pretty doggone close to the same. His powder measure. I found this very interesting. If I would have had a powder measure hopper to thread into this, this would have worked. After getting this cleaned up, after degreasing it and playing around with some old powder that I had, taking my Lee dippers and getting it to stack perfect, you see when we come up, the cavity comes into alignment and you can adjust it so it's fully lined or partially. You can adjust this thing to where you can adjust within tenths of a grain. It's so tight, in fact. It's so tight and smooth, it would cut powder like no other. Okay? You'd have a perfect vertical drop, cavity transfer, vertical drop. That's how it worked. Okay. So I found that to be interesting. Now, the progressive feature. How does the progressive feature work? The progressive feature works like this. If we had our case drop tube right here, Okay. The case would drop into position. We would come back. Grab the case. Now, this block can be adjusted. Okay? This whole thing can be adjusted. So the progressive feature Just like that. That's how that would work. The progressive feature would allow us to run it full like that. Just like that. It's fully progressive. That is how this machine worked. And so, in looking at this, yes, 
he built this and he ran the real deal. He had to. He had to know was his machine capable of just not high volume but a lot of high volume. And I'm convinced that everything he loaded off this he put down range. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fully functioning model. And these, Mike, are the actual cases that were in that machine when you sent it. I haven't really done anything to them. Um, I've left them as is to maintain integrity. So now what you have is you have this all cleaned up where you can uh, put it somewhere uh, where it's protected from the elements. It's just as um, how old Ransom had it back in the day. And I just think it's a, a magnificent uh, museum piece. What a, what a really neat piece, right? So Mike, there you go. And I want to thank you. So I'm going to send this back and uh, I'm going to include this old hand loader magazine from uh, July, August 1981. It's the full write-up of this. You can, you can read it. You can display it with that however you want. Uh, that's my gift to you uh, for uh, trusting me with something that uh, uh, you can't replace this. You couldn't. And that's why I just took my time and cleaning it up and, and uh, getting it functional uh, to the best that we can. And I'll tell you this. I truly believe that uh, in the hands of machinists like you are, Mike, uh, you can actually outfit this with the, the priming tube and the case feed tube and this could actually be a working model without a doubt but it doesn't need to be because it's uh, just what it is it's, it's really awesome so there you go so alright Mike so this just leaves us with this you know I know somehow we got uh, evil Roy involved in this but you know what I've got that covered you know old evil Roy called and, and I told him I said I'll tell you what I said evil Roy I'll just see you out at the old oak so me and evil Roy we're gonna have a talk I think he wants to talk about this old loader so guys and gals that's the end of this video and Mike God bless thank you for letting me work on this we'll see you on the next